All right, again, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the book of the prophet Joel. We're going to be in chapter 2 as we continue our study through the minor prophets. Now, the theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord, and he is the first of the prophets to use that term. It's found five times in the book of Joel, and it's found 75 times in the Bible. And the term is a reference to the tribulation period and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The key verse is Joel chapter 1, verse 15. It says, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Now it's likely, it's likely that Joel was the very first of the writing prophets. Uh, there were other prophets who were written about, but Joel is the first one, maybe Obadiah, uh, but probably Joel is the first one to write down a prophecy himself. Uh, and due to the references we find in Joel uh, to the temple, uh, his ministry was likely uh, centered around the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, if you remember, after the death of Solomon, his son Ro Rehoboam uh, uh, was responsible for splitting the kingdom in half. Uh, ten tribes went with a man by the name of Jeroboam, and they comprised the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, Judah and Benjamin then stayed uh, with Rehoboam, and that comprised the southern kingdom of Judah. So likely, uh, Joel's prophecy was to the southern kingdom of Judah, specifically the area and city of Jerusalem, due to uh, the references to uh, the temple that we find in this book. It's also likely that Joel was a contemporary of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Now, those two prophets ministered to the northern kingdom of Israel while Joel was ministering in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, the setting of this prophecy was that a local, a regional plague of locusts had descended upon the southern kingdom of Judah, and it was unlike anything they had ever seen before. It was literally a, a plague of biblical proportions. The plague was a judgment of the Lord against Judah for their sins, especially because of the sins of their leaders. Uh, the wicked Queen Athaliah, who was the daughter of the equally wicked King Ahab of the northern kingdom of Israel. She had married into the southern kingdom, uh, and, and her husband's name was King Jehoram. Uh, in fact, we read in 2 Kings 8, verse 18, about King Jehoram. It says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, that is, the northern kingdom, the kings that were wicked, just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab, that's Queen Athaliah, was his wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So this judgment was due uh, to their wickedness. Now, while this plague was a local plague, the prophet uses this plague to expound on the coming day of the Lord. Uh, a term that's used, as I mentioned, to speak of the tribulation period that will precede the second coming of Christ. And now, as, as is often the case with Old Testament prophecy, a local event becomes a model or a type of a coming future event prophetically. And this is the case here as Joel weaves in and out of events, both local and future. So it's, it's best to see that Joel uses the plague of locusts to speak prophetically about the coming judgments of God that are associated with the day of the Lord. So if you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, 
for it is at hand. Now notice right away that the day of the Lord is both coming and it is at hand. This is that dual use of prophecy I just spoke about. There is a future coming day of the Lord. And there is an event, a judgment, that is currently at hand. That is the plague of locusts. It's a picture. It's a type of future judgment. So the Lord, through the prophet Joel, calls out to warn of this present and coming judgment. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. You know, God is, is gracious to warn of judgment, both current and future judgment. He's gracious to do that. He wants people to repent. He wants people to avert judgment. And, and as I mentioned in our study through the book of Revelation, God works overtime to save us from his wrath. Isn't that interesting? How hard God works to save us from the wrath to come. God doesn't want anyone going through his wrath. God doesn't want anyone suffering his judgment. God doesn't want anyone going to hell. So he works hard. He works overtime to prevent us from going there, to save us from that. Look at verse 2. Now we have a description. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. So using the present judgment of locusts, which could swarm, by the way, so large. We learned last week that National Geographic, uh, if you look up locusts in National Geographic, it says swarms can be like 460 square miles and contain 40 to 80 million locusts per half mile. And so when they swarmed and when they flew, they could blot out the sun, the moon, and the stars. So the prophet uses this description to describe a coming time of darkness, the day of the Lord in similar terms. And, and I want you to notice here too that the world is not going to get better and better before the Lord returns. I wish it would. I'm sure you wish it would too. Uh, none of us wants to go through difficult times if you do. You need to go see somebody about that. <laughs> but nobody wants to go through difficult times. But the world is not going to get better and better. I wish I could tell you it was. In fact, the day of the Lord begins with night, with darkness and gloominess. The prophet predicts that dark days are coming for planet Earth. The day of the Lord will be a day of clouds and thick darkness, I don't know about you, but darkness is bad enough. Thick darkness, that sounds even worse. It's, it's almost like darkness you can feel and see. It's so thick. It's palatable. It's a day of thick darkness. In fact, we read in Revelation chapter 16, we're going to see this when we get back together in the book of Revelation after Resurrection Sunday. But in Revelation 16.10, it says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and his kingdom became full of darkness. The kingdom of the Antichrist will become full of darkness. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's not going to be a picnic. The world is not going to get better and better and better and we, the church, because of all our good work, are going to usher in the coming of the day of the Lord. In fact, the world is going to get worse and worse and worse before the Lord's return. Now, also using a type of a conquering army, it says, a, a people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. So using that type, uh, the prophet describes 
three different types of judgment that are referenced here. Number one, the current plague of locusts was like an army. Uh, number two, there's coming an invasion by Babylon. Uh, it's many years in the future now uh, from when this was written, but there is coming an invasion by Babylon. And so it speaks of that. And then thirdly, it speaks possibly of the battle of Gog and Magog found in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, or and or, that is, the battle of Armageddon associated with the day of the Lord. Each of these can be described in the same way, and each of these can be referenced by this particular prophecy. Look now at verse 3. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. In chapter 1 of Joel, we read that the plague of locusts was followed by a drought, and the drought was followed by wildfires. The current judgment was destructive, and the future judgment of the day of the Lord will be destructive in a similar way. In fact, we read in Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, that a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So a very similar event is going to happen prophetically in the future. Before the locusts came upon the land, the land was like the Garden of Eden before them. It was green, it was lush, stuff was growing. But after they left, it says, And behind them a desolate wilderness, surely nothing shall escape them. Similarly, in the last days, there will be complete and utter destruction upon planet Earth and its unbelieving inhabitants. In verses 4 and 5, uh, they're described. It says their appearance, that is the locust, using the metaphor of an army, their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds. So they run with a noise like chariots over the mountaintops they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. How many of you ever seen a locust up close? I've only looked at them online, but a locust, their, their heads resemble horse heads. In fact, the Italian word for locust means little horse, and the German word for locust means hay horse because they ate all the hay. They ate all the, all the stuff and they had heads that looked like horses. And you can also imagine the sound that billions of locusts would make as they flew overhead. It says with a noise like chariots over the mountaintops, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, and like a strong people set in battle array. This is figurative language as indicated by the, the use of the word like. So the prophet Joel weaves in and out of a present judgment and future judgment in this description. It says starting in verse 6, it says, Before them the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like, like again figurative language, like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. This description of the plague of locusts also describes the coming Babylonian uh, conquest. And it describes the battle at the end of the age, the day of the Lord. Each of these caused the people of Judah to writhe in pain due to the destruction they bring. The locusts are like mighty men. They're like men of war. But the Babylonians are men of war and, and are men. So the prophet, again, he, he weaves, it's so interesting if you read this, he's, he's kind of weaving the present event into the prophetic future seamlessly. 
The description given here is also of a disciplined army. It says everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. It's also a description of an army that will not be defeated. It says though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. An army that breaks through to the city also. Uh, they run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. So they, they break in. The locusts, of course, broke in. They just flew in. The Babylonians climbed up over the wall and broke in. And the forces of the Antichrist will likewise attack the city. In verse 10 it says, The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark. And the stars diminish their brightness. As I've already mentioned, the plague of locusts would cause the sun and moon to grow dark. And the stars to diminish their brightness as the plague flew overhead. But we also read about earthquakes. And the sun and moon and stars going dim and dark during the tribulation period. So again, uh, prophetically, uh, Joel speaks of their present plague. And he also speaks of the future day of the Lord. In verse 11 it says, The Lord gives voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? I want you to notice that this is not just some natural phenomena being spoken about by the prophet Joel, either the locust, the Babylonians, or the coming day of the Lord. This is the Lord's judgment upon the sin of Judah and eventually the sin of a Christ-rejecting world. And again we read this, it says, For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? The coming day of God's wrath will not be a picnic. It's going to be, it says here, very terrible. The world is not getting better, but instead racing toward this very judgment that is right now, right now, at the door knocking. Next, the Lord tells us how to avoid judgment. As, as I also mentioned earlier, God works overtime to save mankind from his wrath to come. So God will be justified when he judges mankind because he gave us every opportunity to repent and turn from our sins and avoid his judgment. Look now at verses 12 and 13. Now therefore, says the Lord, so this is God speaking now. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. God doesn't want to do us harm. It says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to save us. He wants to save us from his own wrath. But we must recognize our sin and turn to him with all our hearts and if necessary, turn to him with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. We, we need at times to get serious in our repentance. Also, we need to be genuine in our repentance it says, so rend your heart and not your garments. You see, repentance is not just some outward act where you come up front and you kneel down, where you, you tear your garments like the Jews used to do in anguish. They'd rend their garments as a sign uh, of contrition. Anybody can tear you, your shirt. Anybody can come walking up here and kneel down. 
I've been in churches where whenever you do an altar call, the same people come up every time. And you wonder, what, it didn't stick the first time? You need to get saved again? You know, it's got to be a rending of the heart. It's a heart work. It's not an outwork. And that doesn't mean that, that, that the emotions don't follow the heart at times. Amen? Sometimes we're so moved by the Lord, we, we do fall on our knees. We do cry out. We do repent. We do uh, things outwardly because inside there's a work going on in our hearts and lives. Amen? Amen? But just to do the outward without the inward is of no value. The heart must be rent. We must be truly sorry, truly repentant of our sin. In fact, repentance means to change our mind. We were thinking or acting one way, and we turn and think and act another way. In this case, we agree with God and turn from our sin to God and to following his ways. And we do this not out of fear, but because he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. We turn back to God because we know God, and we know he loves us. We know he's good. We know he will forgive us. Amen? Amen. So we turn back to the Lord. We know when we screw up, <laughs> and we turn back to the Lord because we know him, and we know he will receive us. Amen? Just like the, prodig the, the, the parable of the prodigal son, right? He left the father's house, wasted all his, his inheritance on wild living, came back, and on his way back, the father saw him and ran to meet him and embraced him. And, and then that, that's a picture of our God, our Savior. When we turn and come back, he runs out to meet us. He embraces us. He receives us. He loves us again. And so we turn back to God because he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. In verse 14, it says, Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. You see, with God, there is always, always hope. Amen? Amen. There is always hope with God. In the case of Judah, the hope was that they would have a harvest again. And they would then be able to offer sacrifice to the Lord, a, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. But we learned in the last chapter that because of the locusts, because of the drought, because of the wildfires, they were unable to even offer any sacrifices like that of grain or drink to the Lord. Because everything, everything they had was being used uh, to sustain human life. But here we read that if they repent, they will again experience God's goodness. How many of you know that there's times in our life when we suffer need because of our sin? And when we repent, God comes to us and restores that which he has taken away. Amen? Amen. And hopefully I'll tell you a story about that next week that relates to the rest of this chapter of Joel. Now look at verses 15 and 16. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Now, since these plagues affected everyone, then everyone was called to gather together. No one was to be excluded. This was to be a time of national repentance and national reconciliation with God. It will be at the end of the tribulation period that a remnant of Israel will finally repent and be reconciled to God. Now the trumpet of verse 1 was a trumpet of warning. And now this trumpet is a trumpet of assembly. 
all Judah was to assemble. And there would be no exceptions and there would be no excuses. He says, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. So even the children, even babies, even newlyweds were to show up for this sacred assembly. This was to be a time of national repentance and no one was to be excluded and no one was to have any excuse. And I, I know I've mentioned this before. And you know I have to, but it bears repeating until we get it. We're, we're at a crossroads in our own nation today. We, we as a nation stand on the brink of God's judgment. And yet, and yet the church, by and large, the church is asleep. We, the church, need to get serious with the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need to pray like never before. The prayer meeting ought to be the most well-attended meeting right now, not the least. Serious things are going on in our nation, and it may be that the prayers of Christians are the only thing that stands between this nation and God's judgment. But by and large... Christians are not praying, and that's not unique to this church. So I'm not beating you up, although I am. <laughs> but it's not unique to this church. By and large, Christians are not praying as they should. And we should be, amen? We should be. This nation is in desperate need of our prayers right now. Look now at verse 17, our final verse. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? So first and foremost, the spiritual leaders need to be leading in prayer. And crying out to the Lord. It says let the priests who minister to the Lord. Weep between the porch and the altar. The leaders ought to be leading in prayer. There needs to be a lot of weeping. A lot of crying to the Lord by the spiritual leaders in this country. Myself included. Joel even goes so far as to give the spiritual leaders of Judah. A, a sample prayer to pray. He says let them say this, and then he tells them what to pray. Say this. Here's your prayer. If you don't know what to pray, here it is. Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. We likewise need to cry out to God to spare this nation, this people. But this people must repent of their sins or no amount of prayer will save them. Amen. But we can pray for revival, amen? amen? We can pray for repentance. We can pray that God will do everything in his power to turn our nation from its sin back to him. We're living in the last days. Amen. We are living in the last days, the days just before the return of Christ for his church. Can you, do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that we are living in the last days? We are. Yes. That's an amazing, amazing time to be alive as a Christian. The last days. We're not in the middle. We're at the end. Christ is coming back. The world is on a collision course with God's wrath. Yeah. Things are going to continue getting worse and worse. What we are seeing right now is just the tip of the iceberg. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.1, he said this, he said, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Those days are here now. Perilous times are coming. 
And if you don't think we're living in the end times, again, I shared this last week, I'm going to share it again. What Joel has to say in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and you can turn there in your Bible if you like. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He said this, he said, For behold, in those days and at that time, when, here it is, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and this is happening, by the way, right now, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they scattered among the nations. They have also divided my land. And so woe to those who mistreat the Jew and who divide their land. We're living in prophetic times. The times of the rebirth of the nation of Israel for, for 2,000 years. They have not been a nation. They're now a nation again. This prophecy where God will regather. He'll gather uh, his people together. Bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. That time is now. It's been happening for the last hundred years. We're living in prophetic times. Isn't that great to know? As a Christian, that's great to know because we have the rapture of the church to look forward to. Uh, for a world who has rejected Christ, it's a terrible time. Because the battle of Armageddon is coming. It'll take place what's called here in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's also called a har Megiddo. har Megiddo. That's where we get Armageddon, har Megiddo. That's the place, that valley that is out there in front of the hill of Megiddo in Israel. So we're living in the end times. And the Lord could return for his church at any moment. So we, the church, need to get excited about the Lord's coming. <laughs> and we need to get serious in prayer for our nation, for our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. We need to get serious in prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I want to remind you again as we close this evening that we have two, we should have more, but we've got two dedicated prayer meetings every week. One on Tuesday at 10 o'clock a.m. for the ladies, and another on Saturday morning, 8 o'clock a.m. with coffee for the fellows. Make a commitment. Make a commitment to pray. Amen? Amen. Let's pray now. Father, we so, so thank you once again for your word. Thank you for the encouragement we gain from your word. Even in the midst of knowing what's coming upon this world, we know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming back to set up his kingdom. And we who believe are going to join you in your kingdom, Lord. You said in your word that we will rule and reign with you for a thousand years. And I can't even get my mind around ruling and reigning with you, Lord. But it's true because your word declares it. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray for our, our county in which we live. So many in our county don't know you. We pray, uh, Lord, we, we have this, this Resurrection Sunday. We've got Good Friday. We've got these, these sacred Christian holidays coming up that people come to church that wouldn't ordinarily come. Lord, may this year be the year of their salvation. The year the gospel penetrates their heart. The year they surrender their lives to your love. The year that they find victory in Jesus. And so, Lord, may many, many be saved throughout our county at, at all of the various evangelical Christian uh, church services that are held uh, this coming Resurrection Sunday. Bless our dear brother, uh, Pastor John Sterley, uh, as he conducts a sunrise service. Lord, keep those folks warm. And, and Lord, uh, just anoint him. Anoint your word through him. May that sunrise service be a powerful testimony of Jesus Christ. 
and may there be many who are saved. And likewise, for our services this coming Sunday, Lord, we pray for salvation, that there would be folks here that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, but this would be the day, the day of their salvation. And so we lift all of these things up to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. amen. God bless you.